my mouth and the meditation mm -hmm. of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, thank you for welcoming us to your congregation. It is indeed a beautiful church or a chapel to come and worship the Almighty God this morning. We, the Diocesan Children's uh, Ministry team and representatives of Sunday School teachers throughout West Malaysia are gathered here in uh, Sento for a three-day conference. And we are happy to announce that uh, Margaret Nguyen has been uh, appointed by the Diocesan Bishop to be the chairman of the children's ministry for the next four years. Maybe they would like to see you, Margaret. <laughs> Together with her, they have a committee, and I pray that the church will continue to support the children's ministry in our diocese. Today, I want to look at three things from the three readings we have heard this morning. The Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Gospel. As a form of introduction, I'd like to present to you this morning that the Old Testament gives us Isaiah's vision of a holy God. God enthroned on his seat, the Holy One. In the New Testament, Paul explains that our king is no ordinary king. He comes to free us from the Torah. He comes to free us so that we may live a life worthy of his calling. And the gospel today reminds us of that one man who was caught up in the whole observance of the law. And he wanted to be freed from the law and wanted to experience something different which Jesus had to offer. And so he comes before Jesus seeking for an answer. And I hope that in today's meditation we can capture the essence of what these three uh, readings would imply upon us for, for this morning. First of all, I'd like to present to you from the Old Testament a beautiful scene of Isaiah's vision. It is a vision that all of us would one day like to see and God willing, we will see when we leave this world of ours. When we are ready to see our Lord and our Maker, we will get this opportunity to see what we, Isaiah uh, gives to us this morning. But it's not only Isaiah who gives us this vision. If you look at the scripture, you will also see Ezekiel giving at the last chapter, chapter 30 or 31. He gives uh, the similar vision of God enthroned on his throne. And along with that, all kinds of things happen when Jesus sits on his throne. But for today, we see, we hear from Isaiah. The vision of Isaiah tells us, one, when God is present on his throne, God's presence is there. God is present at that place. And when God is present, there is a song that has been sung regularly. It is a 24-hour song, as the scripture tells us. And this is a song that we have captured in our Holy Communion. And it is sung three times, over and over again. And that our God is no ordinary God. It is a holy God, an awesome God. And so when you read at Isaiah's vision, he says the angels uh, and the archangels stand around the throne and they are singing, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee. And so you see this concept of the presence of God, you see a holy God, but it's not only just that. Our God rules the earth. He's, in, he's the creator of the universe. So Isaiah presents these three elements to tell us that this is an a, a awesome God, a special God to which we worship. And when we come before a holy God, 
There's only one thing that convicts us. The more we go closer before a holy God, we sense that something is not right within us. We see our unworthiness when we come before a worthy God. And so as we approach God, we realize that we are lost. We come with unclean lips. We dwell among unclean people, as Isaiah puts it. And he comes to convict us of our unworthiness. And that's our response. The more closer you get to go to God, you find that your life will be transformed. The more nearer you get to God, you find that He is so awesome that you cannot stand before Him, that you need to kneel, you need to bow down before an awesome God. And that is what Isaiah presents to us today. But more especially, we find that in this kingship of God, Isaiah puts another connotation. And he says, when you stand before a holy God and find yourself unworthy with unclean lips coming before God, God does something. Although you may be unclean before God, although you may be, you come with unclean lips, yet God has chosen his servant to speak for him. So when Isaiah stood before God, God says, no, I will choose you to be my servant. I will choose you to be my witness throughout all nations. And so that happens also to Jeremiah. If you read Jeremiah, Jeremiah turns on and says, Lord, I'm too young to do anything. Or in our context, Lord, I'm too old to do anything. Don't choose me, choose someone else. But when you stand before, when you are ready to stand before a holy God, when you are ready to stand before an awesome God, you must be ready to offer yourself and say, God, use me. Use me. And wait for the moment that God would choose you, you, you alone, to serve Him and serve Him for the rest of your life. As we come to the New Testament, we see this whole kingdom of God uh, being revealed through Pauline's teaching. In Romans, as we all know, he, Paul talks about the doctrinal nature and more, more so about the kingdom of God. And how is the kingdom of God or the kingship of God presented by Paul to us this morning? He brings to us of in terms of a comparison with the Old Testament. He relates to Sarah as the uh, woman of freedom, giving freedom to the Israelites. Then he looks at Hagar, the son, the, fam the, the, the lineage of slavery. So you see one being free, one being a slave. And that genealogy goes through right throughout the Old Testament. But Paul takes this and says, do not let your sin dominate your life. In other words, he takes the whole example of a life of slavery into the context of a personal relationship between God and ourselves. And he says, don't let sin, which is like slavery, encompass you in your life. And so Paul says this very strongly in the New Testament. He says, be free. Don't live a life of sin. Don't live a life under the Torah. Don't live a life under rules and regulations. And so he introduces a new word to the Israelites, to the Jews. And he says, let the Spirit of God move among you, Penuma. It's amazing eh, how our life of slavery can encompass us, can lock us and make us miserable at times when we want to try to understand God. And when we find that we live in a life of sin, we go far away from God. We cannot understand or comprehend the enormity of God in our lives. God is so great that when we get closer to Him, 
we feel free to come and worship God. And so Paul says, worship in the spirit. Let the spirit of God move within you. Let the spirit of God come within you so that you may be a free people of God. And so he says, by bring, sending the Holy Spirit to you, I'm making you a children of God, not slaves of God. We don't stand before God today to say that we are slaves of God, although there is a very nice Tamil hymn that is written by D.T. Niles, slaves, uh, slave of oh God, I think. Yellam uh, Yesuwe. If you translate that into English, you have slaves of God. But we are children, children of the living Father. And when the Spirit of God comes upon us, He liberates us and claims us to be His children. And so when we are His children, once again, Paul says, the moment God claims you to be His child, it leads you to repentance. It leads you to repentance and to know that you need to bow down before Him and to seek His grace, to seek His forgiveness so that we may be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot receive the Holy Spirit if we don't confess our sins. If we allow the old nature of ours to be within us, if we allow our old self to stay within us and ask God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. That is not possible. That's what Paul is trying to say to us. He's saying, unless you discard your old life, unless you do away with the past, unless you do away with the things that bring slavery to your life, you then can be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we have just celebrated Pentecost uh, last Sunday, today we celebrate Pen Trinity as we see the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit coming and ministering to God's children and giving them the power of the Holy Spirit. We come to the next point in the Gospel. Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a very influential uh, personality in the Roman uh, authorities. He had all the power. He was a very powerful man. He was a very learned man. But he was also a man who was eager to find out how he can be released from the captivity of sin, from the captivity of slavery to the Torah. As we all know, in the Old Testament, there are 600 over laws that every Jew must follow in his lifetime. Imagine, the, even Ten Commandments we can't follow from time to time. What about 600 bylaws that a Jew needs to be followed? In other words, every act that he does must be carefully orchestrated so that he does not fall into sin. So rigid is his experience of God by following his Torah that he came before an awesome God and said, God, I want to be released from all these this, uh, rules and regulation. I want to be free in worshipping you. I want to have a peaceful heart in my mind as I worship God. How can I do that? And he comes before God. Now, just imagine, Nicodemus is of another kingdom, the earthly kingdom, where he has the power, the authority to do whatever he wishes. But he comes before God's kingdom. When he comes before Jesus, whose kingdom is ruled by different sets of values, a different set of uh, uh, virtues of life. And when we come before that, Nicodemus asks, how, what must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus seized the opportunity and said, you must be born anew. 
Now that's the translation from the Greek text, you know. But if you look at some other Bibles, you, that word can also be translated as you must be born again. Now is there a difference between born anew and born again? Well, in this context of ours, a lot of people have begun to teach that born again is something different from born anew. But suffice it to say that I want to look at the word being born anew. When Nicodemus came before Jesus, he said this, you need to be born anew. Born anew in terms of character. Born anew in terms of the virtues of life. Born again in terms of the service to a wonderful God. In other words, there is a complete transformation of the self. And the complete transformation of the self can be equated with the word metanoia, which means repentance of sin. When you say you are sorry, it means you are taking a 300 degrees turn and saying to God, I will not look at my past, I will not do the things that I have done before, I will change my ways and come before you and be with you. So when Nicodemus faced Jesus, he was asked to be transformed by the Holy God. And God says, be transformed, not by the laws before you, not by the, the regulations that are put forth in the um, Old Testament, but be transformed by God himself. And when God transforms each one of us this morning, he gives us a new heart. A new heart. He gives us a new spirit that he will put in our hearts. He will remove a heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. In other words, he, give us, he will make us children of the kingdom of God. My dear friends, in all this, what is God calling us to do this morning? May I submit to you this morning three things. I'm not sure whether you are aware of it, and I'm sure in some sense you are, that when you enter this church, you are telling yourself, you're telling all of us, I am coming to worship an awesome God. I am coming here to worship a God who is holy, holy, holy. A holy God. Not any ordinary God. So when we stand in the presence of Almighty God this morning, may we stand along with the angels and archangels in heaven where they are singing before God's throne and worshipping Him. And while we are alive here on earth, we are worshipping this holy God. The more you worship this holy God, I am sure you feel convicted of your sins. And so in our liturgy, in the Anglican liturgy, which is one of the most beautiful liturgies that you can ever find, which comes from the earliest liturgy called St. James Liturgy, way back during our... Uh, a liturgy written by Jesus' own disciple. And in that liturgy is written that we stand before a holy God and we say holy, holy, holy. And in, the con in that context, there is always forgiveness, confession of sin. That's the beautiful part of our Anglican worship. The more you stand before God, you finally feel that you need to kneel before God and say sorry for the things that you have done amiss in your life. And when you have experienced that forgiveness of God, you feel liberated. Lord, my sins are no more. Thank you for giving me, for forgiving me. I'm free from all the clutches of this world. I can now stand before you and worship you. But Nicodemus' life reminds us 
that there is a need for each one of us present here to be born anew in the spirit if you have not already experienced this wonderful experience of knowing god in a very special way i pray that god's spirit will come upon you touch you so that you may be born anew in the presence of god may we come to worship almighty god this morning with a heart of thanksgiving with joy and happiness that we are not worshiping any stone or image or idol but a holy god who is present among us may all glory and honor be to almighty god amen